are there are there plants and maybe some that you still see for sale that you especially want to alert people to um, that have been the hardest to deal with? Um, because what I'm seeing is, again, it's a lot of times I just it's like when we see a problem, it's like we just want to find a way around the problem as opposed to address the problem. <laughs> we want to steer around it or something like all these sterile versions of our worst no-no plants like barberries that won't you know, set seed. Well, okay, but look, what if we could have something besides a barber, <laughs> you know, instead, like, why are we putting all of our, our efforts at the, the um, research facilities at a lot of the universities that are doing breeding? Why are we doing that instead of, you know, I get obsessed with that. I want to know, put it into something else that's more beneficial. Um, I would, I would just pick up where you left off Margaret and go with barberry and, uh, you know, burning bush as well. I just moved, okay. um, to the woods of Connecticut and Oof. theoretically they're, um, you know, prohibited and regulated and you're not supposed to sell them. Um, but even for the non-sterile cultivars, you can just order them on any box store and have them shipped to your house. Like the regulation around that is, is really poor. And I think, um, you know, in this movement, so much of our efforts go into this super important work of repairing the damage that has happened in ways that are joyous and fun and hard work of, of like gardening, right? We're all gardeners. We love to plant plants. And, um, but we should also, while we're focused on that damage repair, we should also try to stop damage from happening in the first place. And I think that, you know, we could all do a better job of that, quite frankly, and those plants, especially like barberry, but really any plant that's been shown to cause ecolo ecological damage, they should just not be in the trade. Um, and the fact that they are is just a real tragedy. And, um, you know, there's over a thousand people on this Zoom call right now. We have so much power behind us that if we organize to um, change state regulations uh, lobby for growers and nurseries and box stores to change their inventories. We can really do that. And I think, you know, it's, it's certainly not as fun as gardening, uh, which is why it's, uh, I don't think people do it that much, but it is just as important as, as the work that we're all, we all love to do. We're never going to know when a plant is going to become an issue, right? That's always my biggest concern. We just keep you just keep introducing new plants and we don't know what's going to happen, which to me is smacks of so much human supremacy that drives me crazy. Um, but I really want to give a sort of sarcastic response too and say butterfly bush, hosta, orange daylily. You know, these aren't necessarily <laughs> problematic plants totally, but they're overplanted. And, um, you know, I think about shade gardens and people say, I can only put a hosta here. It's the only thing that works. And I always say, well, here's 20, uh, 20 plants off the top of my head that are going to work in a shade garden um, that work in, you know, you see these plants in uh, along rivers and riparian areas, uh, even here in Nebraska, uh, where we have those communities. So that's my mini sarcastic response, I guess. So not just the really naughty naughties like the barberries that are seen yeah. and have taken over and created hedgerow, you know, hedgerows and or the multiflora roses or the privets and honeysuckles and Asian honeysuckles and so forth, but also the sort of waste of space you're saying kind of plants. Yeah. Aggregate you. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not saying don't have, I, I think hostas come with really cool in a bed of carex, albicans, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that, that textual contrast is really neat, but the host is not doing anything. We can do something more effective there for all sorts of wildlife. Right. 